Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Health Matters. Our guest in studio tonight is Nicole Breen, who is the project leader of information and awareness at the South African Federation for Mental Health. And the focus is on psychosocial disability. It is Psychosocial Disability Awareness Month, and Nicole has also informed me that it's com Corporate Wellness Week because they commemorate many events and, and themes during weeks and months of the year. So welcome to you, Nicole. And before we proceed, I would like to begin with a terbiyah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And looking at mental health, because we're speaking about mental health, and a verse from the Quran, there are six actually verses that I would like to reflect on. Most of us have felt some kind of anxiety in our lives prior to a test, standing before a crowd, going to a place where you don't know anyone. But for others, Anxiety may feel like an overwhelming presence, and there is no shame in getting help with that. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, it is one of the most common mental difficulties facing America, with nearly 40 million Americans suffering from it. I'd really like to emphasize this next point. If you have anxiety, it does not mean your connection with your Creator is weak or that you aren't a good Muslim. Having an anxiety disorder is not your fault. And it, not, it is not something that is easily controlled. But there are ways you can manage it. And these next few, next few verses from the Holy Quran may help you do just that. But they plan, verse, verse 1, but they plan and Allah plans. And Allah is the best of planners. Accepting that you cannot control everything is a major key to managing anxiety, which can be done more easily with the understanding that Allah has a greater plan and that He knows what is best for us. Verily, verse 2, verily in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. Oh, you have O oh, you who have believed, seek help through patience and prayer. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. Patience is difficult, but it is important. Combined with prayer and remembrance of Allah, patience will help you, help you get through the tough times to see that the pieces that were once all up in the air fell into place. Verse 4. Indeed, after hardship, there is ease. Allah has spoken about being tested in the Quran. This world is for tests, and with these tests, we will grow as people and grow closer to our Creator. He has also promised that there will be ease after every hardship. Look forward to that. Know that the situation you are in won't be forever, that you will get through it, and that it will feel amazing when you do. Verse 5, Allah is sufficient for us and He is an excellent trustee. As they say, let go and let Allah. We believe that Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein and that He is all-knowing, just and the most merciful. With that in mind, place your worries and fears with Him and really see that there is someone taking care of you. Verse 6, I entrust my affairs unto God. Truly, Allah is aware of his servants. This verse is similar to the one before. It is a nice reminder for ourselves that Allah is aware of our problems and we, as Muslims, are aware that he is looking out for us. That being said, if you feel that you are struggling with anxiety, talk to your doctor and get the proper help you need. These are just six of many Quranic verses that can allow one not to feel so alone 
and overwhelmed. Jazakumullah al khair, sarakullah al adeen. We will now continue with our great guest, Nicole Breen. Nicole is a lawyer. I think I would like to also congratulate her. She's just recently graduated with her master's as well at UP University. So well done, Nicole. And Nicole has been in the field working with uh, many organizations, but has been recently appointed to this position at the Federation of Mental Health, South African Federation of Mental Health. So perhaps I think just for the viewers to appreciate and understand what does the Federation do? South African Federation for Mental Health is a national organization and um, we work to protect and uphold the rights of people with intellectual disabilities, psychosocial disabilities and mental illnesses. We are constituted of 17 mental health societies who provide direct services um, to the people we serve. Um, in our offices, we focus on advocacy and development at um, global, national and uh, more local spheres, as well as um, information and awareness. So as you've highlighted, you've said that from what we understand, you're not a direct service provider but your affiliates are the direct service providers. So your role is that of advocacy. So if, if people have human rights issues or any other kind of challenges that they would need support with, uh, should they be, uh, should they be uh, contacting the Federation then? Um, we have a, um, an information desk um, where we can provide assistance or referrals. Okay, so coming to the very thorny subject of life is a domini, uh, people that have experienced that kind of violation, would that fall on your desk? Um, personally, um, what would happen is um, I would be made aware of it and it would be my, I would be then enjoined to um, raise awareness of the plight of these individuals and um, to um, perhaps design a campaign surrounding um, so surrounding this issue, which is what we've done for Psychosocial Disability Awareness Month. So this is Psychosocial Disability Month. Can you speak to a little bit of that, explaining to the viewers what that all means? Well, I think first of all, we have to explain what a psychosocial disability is. So um, a psychosocial disability, according to the UN High Commissioners for Human Rights report, is um, an instance where a person, regardless of identification or self-identification of um, a mental health condition, is excluded um, from accessing their rights or when they are excluded from participating in society. Now, this speaks to a number of things. First of all, it speaks to the pervasive nature of the disorder, that it um, influences different aspects of a person's life. Secondly, it speaks to a lack of bargaining power on the part of the person, with the person um, having difficulty in um, you know, interacting with society and being socially excluded and perhaps being caught up in something like a poverty trap. Um, finally, it, it, um, the definition also talks about actual or perceived impairment. So, so I want to stop there. Nicole, when you speak about psychosocial disability, can you give specific examples, illustrate what you actually mean by a psychosocial disability? Well, a psychosocial disability is um, when a mental illness has become pervasive and ends up actually being disabling um, and so, so and what kind of mental illness would you focus on well, or something describe? like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or anxiety or depression or um, you know there's a broad spectrum of it you know um, basically it occurs when um, a person's disability prevents them from accessing their rights from participating from um, you know when it um, takes away um, from them their their right to choose to behave in society, you know, as they would want to and so, so on. The, from what I'm understanding is that 
they get trapped into this situation, something which they have no control over. As you've described, the bipolar disorder, you've talked about depression and overwhelming anxiety, where they actually are so overwhelmed and stuck and they feel trapped in this and this, as a result of that, they cannot move beyond that. They cannot execute their normal daily functions. And, and that is what, when you speak about psychosocial disabilities. Uh, so when you have focused this month on awareness, what is it that you would like the public to know? What are some of the key messages that you would like to relate to them? Well, our campaign is called um, Blockades in an Era of Continuum. So what this speaks to are the bottlenecks um, in the system that exist despite a comprehensive rights-based framework. So what we would like the public to know about are issues surrounding community-based care, social stigma, lack of information, um, poor understanding on the part of um, role players, um, and various um, and various other um, aspects um, ancillary to that. Okay, and how can the public access support? Where do they access support? How do they actually go and and find out that they you know would get the, the relevant support that they need? Well, like I've said, um, we do have our help desk. Um, which um, people can go to to access support or referrals. Um, the uh, Mental Health Society's um, details of them are available online on our website. Um, so if you can just perhaps reflect on those details so that people know. Um, our website is www.safmh.org.za. Um, our telephone number is 011. 781 And is this office hours or outside of office hours? Um, this would be during office hours. Okay. But for the emergency, the crisis situations, I would presume they would have to go to the affiliates. Um, for the out-of-office um, emergency, we would usually refer them to the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Okay, so SADC. Yes. Okay, and uh, have you have you got details of no, SADC? No, not. Okay, no. but they're also on the website. Yes. It would be uh, on the website, and I know they have a crisis line, a 24-hour yes. suicide line as well. So uh, would suicide also fall under the psychosocial disability, attempted suicides and suicidal ideations? Um, yes, it would if it becomes um, pervasive, which is a necessary implication of it. So when you say pervasive, they become so engrossed with it that they cannot actually move beyond that situation. Yes. They, they're so engulfed with it, they don't see the wood for the trees and they cannot actually see life beyond that. Yes. They, they're actually trapped in that situation. And Nicole, so what other projects? We're actually going on to an ad break. So quickly, if you can just tell us what other uh, campaigns are you running during the Psychosocial Disability Month? Well, our campaign, um, as I've said, involves awareness raising. Mm. So it's going to be release of press releases, opinion pieces, and um, importantly, a um, submission to the president and um, uh, disability machine disability machinery um, forum um, so this will illustrate the submission will illustrate how the white paper on the rights of persons with disabilities is not being adequately implemented and this has led not only to the life as a crisis but also crises beyond that have emerged and in as part of your awareness raising is there any hint of people accessing grants for disabilities, how they can access, and the eligibility of uh, qualifying for a grant? We haven't focused on that aspect. Um, we've been focusing on aspects like community-based care where there are subsidies, okay. so issues surrounding subsidies, getting of subsidies. Um, 
Okay, so that would obviously be quite helpful as well, useful right. information. And on that note, we'll take an ad break and continue with uh, psychosocial disability awareness. <music> For all your flexible packaging, snack packaging, candy wrapper, shrink sleeves, labels, cartons and other custom packaging, contact CPP Flexibles on 072-474-1132 and at www.cppflexibles.co.za. Keep yourself and the kids happy this winter because we at International Brands Outlet have got you covered. With the dopest brands from polo to Converse sneakers and a whole lot in between to keep you covered winter and summer, IBO will ease you into the office all the weekend in style with a range of products to keep the kids, mom and dad happy. Afford your true self with International Brands Outlet. IBO, affordable quality and style. Honda Johannesburg South services from 699 rands. Visit www.hondajhb.co.za. Yusuf Waja Insurance Brokers specializes in Sharia compliant savings and investments. We have been committed to fast, friendly and efficient service since 1989. Use our tried and tested relationships to work for you. From savings and investments plans to retirement and pension planning, we have the best solution waiting for you. Now, that's for sure. IDM has translated the Quran into Afrikaans, Koza, Zulu, Chichiwe, and Sutu. The Qurans are distributed free of charge. Each Quran costs 50 rands. Sponsor a pack of 100 Qurans for only 5,000 rands and earn Sadaka Jaria. Call IDM at 031-304-6883. IDM, taking Islam to as many hearts and homes as possible. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. For the viewers that have just tuned in, our guest in studio tonight is a lawyer, Nicole Breen, who is the project leader of information and awareness at the South African Federation for Mental Health. And the focus of tonight's discussion is on psychosocial disability awareness as it is Psychosocial Disability Awareness Month. And we've got three segments left. So people, if you have any questions, please hold on to them. And in the third and fourth segment, you could raise your questions or comments. Now, Nicole, you know, you, you mentioned this Awareness Month. Why have an Awareness Month? You know, what is the purpose of having an Awareness Month? Well, uh, I think uh, if you look at our society, um, you know, actual perceived stigma um, um, towards people with psychosocial disabilities, uh, mental illness and intellectual disability is rife. And um, it precludes them from um, having jobs, from getting an education, from all sorts of other aspects. And, um, you know, it's only through um, addressing the stigma through education 
that you can ever hope to ameliorate their plight. And um, in addition to that, you know, there are so many defects or deficits rather in the system that um, I think, um, you know, it's um, our duty to inform the public so that action can be taken um, surrounding these issues. So when you say action to be taken, I, I gather you mean more than just access to opportunities and resources, but it's also opening many avenues where persons with disabilities uh, are given greater opportunities to access their rights, but also uh, employment opportunities, uh, accessing disability government grants or state grants, uh, community-based facilities, uh, you know, your devices that they need, um, um, mobility devices, all sorts of uh, opportunities that may be made available that they previously have not known about. And, and this is a platform where more information is disseminated to enable people to be more empowered. Precisely. Um, I also think that, um, you know, um, if um, there was a greater level of understanding surrounding the difficulties faced by people with intellectual disabilities, psychosocial disabilities and mental illness, that, um, you know, um, people around these individuals themselves would um, also assist in taking action. Okay, so you've identified mental illnesses, psychosocial disabilities, and you said cognitive challenges or the cognitive impairments. Intellectual disabilities. Intellectual disabilities. So th this is quite a broad category uh, that you've identified. And something that you said earlier on, which I think we need to take cognizance of, is the social stigma. Because often people are afraid or not sufficiently informed and hence would not be able to access these resources. And as the Federation, you take this upon yourself, uh, that it's your responsibility and that you've been entrusted with this responsibility to ensure that relevant information is filtered down on the ground so that people can have access to this and that they could be given opportunities. Now, we know that you also mentioned about uh, access to hospital settings or clinics and community-based centers. I'm going to raise the issue of Isidemeni and institutions. What are some of the challenges surrounding these kind of uh, institutions? Well, um, the, those are um, particularly interesting questions. Um, from um, the perspective of um, community-based settings, I'll start with this because, you know, it was um, the epicenter of the life is demanding crisis. Um, what I will say about it is this: so um, there are two as two pre predominating aspects that have arisen since life is demanding. You know, you talk about life after is demanding moving forward. You know, so has anything changed? Yes, you know, now that's what? important. Has anything changed? Right. If well, so, what? Um, well, they've been so, so. First of all, there's been this loss of trust. You know, um, in terms of. Um, government and NGOs and the general public and NGOs, which has made it difficult for them to survive, you know, to get subsidies, to get donations and so on, because um, they've been, they, they've all been, you know, painted with the same brush as the organizations in life is demanding where people died and, you know, so on. And, and there's so, been gross violation of rights. Yes, of course there has, but not by all NGOs. There are some NGOs that are doing and have always done good work you know but now those NGOs are faced with this culture of mistrust that has arisen you know from um, life is domani and that's problematic you know because what if these NGOs now have to shut their doors you know what if they can't look after the patients in their care you know then you ha you you have a situation where um, people might end up sending their loved ones or 
um, to unregistered facilities, facilities because yes. there's nowhere for them to go. Mm, um, mm. Also, there's been um, almost a knee-jerk reaction. Um, the government has issued um, policy guidelines for licensing of residential um, and or daycare facilities. Now, um, this is somewhat of a knee-jerk reaction in terms of, um, you know, what the government sought to do to um, resolve the issues surrounding life acetamani. Um And um, while we applaud government's efforts to regulate, um, you know, the state of um, the licensing of NGOs, you know, it's also, it's, it's very difficult because the guidelines are so stringent that not even most hospitals comply with the requirements of them, um, which has the effect that, um, again, NGOs are not going to get licenses, they're not going to get subsidies, they may have to close their doors. You they know? would have to turn needy people away, people who need, who desperately need that support and intervention and service. Precisely. So, like you've said, the prerequisites and the conditions, the criteria now it seems from one extreme to the other, where previously it was not regulated, it's now over-regulated, mm. making it very difficult or impossible for people to actually reach out to those in need. Mm. Um, what would you say uh, could have been done differently regarding this whole life after Isidemeni? Um Well, um, I, I would have said that um, there ought to... Um, have been, you know, more consultation with government mm. and with NGOs to secure that relationship of trust. And um, I would also have said that um, in terms of implementation of the guidelines, that there should have been an attached capacitation program or um, an offer um, from government to assist NGOs in meeting the criteria. So NGOs, just for the viewers, non-governmental organizations these uh, institutions or establishments or organizations that actually provide support, care, and residential facilities to persons with psychosocial disabilities, which you clearly articulated early on, intellectual disabilities, your mental illnesses, and um, other anxieties, depression, all sorts of other situations where people, it becomes pervasive in their life where they cannot move on. And what criteria would a person need to qualify to be eligible to become a resident of such a facility? Well, I think... And I'm talking about state facilities or NGOs, yes. Um, I would say that that, um, is some, that that is a determination that a doctor has to make. So not one that I'm qualified to discuss. Okay, so for the viewers out there, they would have to go and see their regular GP or is it a, uh, you know, a specific doctor, whether it's with Department of Health or Department of Social Development? Well, uh, I think that would differ between um, whether you're in the uh, private sector or the government sector, um, but I would imagine it's a process of referrals. Okay, and... Obviously, it's not just the medical practitioner's referral. There's probably a social worker that will have to also be part of this process, the evaluation process to, to make a, uh, an application to have this person institutionalized. Am I correct in that? I'd imagine so, yes. Okay. And then obviously that... Uh, once the application is processed, the funding would come off the disability grant. If they're not on one, an application would have to be made for a disability grant, a psychosocial disability grant. As far as I know, yes. And then that would fall under the um, uh, ambit of social development because, you know, the grants come from SASA, if I'm correct. Yes. Okay, so it's, I think it's government departments working together in collaboration ensuring the best interests of the clients. And this would apply to both children and adults, am I right? Yes. Okay. Is there anything else before we move on to the ad break? Just one last um, thing. I would also want to discuss hospitals quickly. Okay, so we've got like 30 seconds. So okay, maybe... so um, the, um, there's been um, a spotlight shone on the mental health care system like never before. 
And um, it's been revealed that um, there are human rights atrocities being committed in hospitals all over the country. Mm. Um, in the Eastern Cape, um, you know, inappropriate seclusion facilities, in, inadequate keeping of birth and death records, um, one patient assaulting another, staff shortages, etc., um, have come to the fore. And then um, also, in addition to that, you know, there's been um, a spate of patients in Johannesburg dying violent deaths, you know, one of whom you know, uh, broke open burglar bars and um, fell to his death afterwards, you so know. So there, there's been negligence in, in monitoring and management of these patients, but there's also been uh, uh, situations yeah. assaults committed on these inpatients as well by the caretakers. Correct. So there are a lot of human atrocities that actually go on behind the scenes within the institutions that are supposed to house them and protect them. And on that note, we'll go on to an ad break and continue with our discussion. Khidmatul Awam, South Africa's most trusted and leading Hajj operator, offering the best, most affordable and suitable Hajj packages to suit all your Hajj requirements. With full reduced prices, step-by-step -step Hajj guidance, frontline and five-star hotels in Medina, Mecca, and a unique building in Azizia. We have a full team of committed Khadims and Ulema. Khidmatul Awam will make your Hajj a spiritual experience. You also have the option of adding a couple's room in Azizia or our Aksai add-on to your package. Come into any one of our three regional branches or contact Contact us nationally on 010-600-5786. Travel with an operator that cares. Everything in life evolves and so should your fitment center. Evolution Wheel and Tire Fitment Center offers you great reliable service at affordable prices. Get more tire deals, get more for your vehicle. Evolution Wheel and Tire, a new dimension in fitment. Call us now on 011-499-0072 or 3. So once your Islamic family store. At So once we have an extensive selection of products to suit your Islamic lifestyle. Break your fast with our dates. Get fitted in our latest garments, whether for him or for her. Increase your knowledge with a book or memorize Quran with an audio. Win hearts with a memorable gift. As a family, we're constantly striving to provide your family with the best quality products at affordable prices. So once. Your Islamic family store. Your family's convenience is our commitment. Are you importing or exporting products for your business? Why don't you contact 4Way for an innovative logistics solution? See Air, Rail or Road. 4Way has a solution for you. Combinators is a place to be, to eat. Combinators is a place when you're hungry. When your tongue is feeling funny, and there ain't no food for money, then the place to be is Combinators. For good Italian taste, when nothing goes to waste. For original wood fired pizza and pasta. And for a fusion of international taste. <laughs> Visit Cami Naturals and Purple Burger at Overport, Durban City, and now Peter Maritzburg. And for the kiddies, Planet Purple at our Overport store. Cami Naturals now introducing Let's Tie. Sponsor a revert mother in learning the Dean for only 300 rands per month or 3,600 rands per year. Contact Madrasa Ihya Ulumuddin Lilbanat today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. For the viewers that have just tuned in, we've got our guest in studio tonight is Nicole Breen, who's a lawyer, and she's the project leader of information and awareness at the South African Federation for Mental Health, and the discussion is on psychosocial disability awareness. 
I'm sure many of you uh, see this as a mouthful, but I think it's a very needed uh, discussion because the focus is on mental health issues, intellectual disabilities, anxiety, and as was mentioned earlier in the program, that the, you know, we look at your bipolar disorders, your mood disorders, your anxiety disorders, which become pervasive in the lives of many individuals, both adults and children. And it is something that people have no control over. And often when they are identified and diagno diagnosed, it's often seen as a social stigma and disempowering. And I think the awareness raising is to move away from that stigma and, and social humiliation of these individuals. So I'm going to hand over to Nicole to speak about some of the discrimination that these people experience and of course to also look at the revolving door phenomenon. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Irma. Um, I, I think um, we've already covered the issue of um, social stigma. Um, and so um, that is an attitudinal aspect and um, it um, concerns itself with um, individuals or groups um, treating people with psychosocial disabilities differently and um, you know differently in um, a way that is tantamount to unfair discrimination um, and um, you know this uh, is not you, you know this is not only within society within communities you know it's even within you know healthcare establishments we have cool. I'm going to pause there we've got a caller on the line assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam uh, I would like to ask your guest uh, questions about people that are idle you know have nothing to do and, uh, you know, sort of just loitering around and so forth. Does that make you prone to become bipolar or any other mental uh, illnesses? So, did you understand what the caller said? No. Yes, uh, okay. I, I did. Uh, so, um, you, if, if I'm correct, you were saying um, if you're um, idle, idle, yes. so you're, you're not busy loitering doing something? Loitering around, as he said, yes. Okay, well, um, mental illnesses, um, they have a, a, a couple of um, determinants, you know, when they arise in a person. They can be genetic. They can come about due to a traumatic event or, um, you know, um, different reasons. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I've never heard of there being any definitive um, idea that they come about due to a person being idle specifically. Does that answer your question, brother? Uh, yeah, what, what I, uh, the way I understand is like uh, things like reading and being occupied all along. Uh, you know, your thoughts don't uh, sort of wander. Uh, and so in other words, it's an exercise for your brain, you know, your, for, your, for your mind. Because there's no other way that you can exercise on your mind, but it's to be occupied. And you know, you'll find that the people that are always occupied are sort of more content and they have a different outlook in life. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, brother. I think people that obviously do, that do not feel fulfilled are more likely to, uh, you know, manifest uh, depression and have negative thoughts. But as our guest illustrated very clearly, that just being bored or idle is not a determinant of intellectual disability or mental illness or anxiety. There are other underlying reasons pathology and genetic uh, factors that one needs to consider. And I think obviously, if there's a specific case you're referring to, then that needs to be referred to your GP and of course thereafter to the psychiatrist and clinical psychologist. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran Dalilan. So, go continue with where we left off, sorry. Um, um, I, I believe I was um, discussing um, stigma and mm, um, mm. you know where where you can actually find it and um, you know we have had reports of um, mental health care users um, in um, you know hospitals um, saying that they are too afraid to 
report having been treated badly by staff for fear of reprisal. You know, so um, stigma even at that level is rife and um, people are, you know, afraid and uncomfortable with the situation but don't feel sufficiently empowered to actually do something about it. And that's how mental health care users in this country are situated. You know, whether it be someone with a psychosocial disability or a mental illness or someone who's hospitalized or someone who's in the community, you know, um, people are suffering under this, um, you know, in within this realm of social stigma from which um, there often seems to be no respite. And of course, that's one of the contributors of the human rights atrocities, which mm. was so... Uh, uh, visible with life is a domaini. But I think if we can continue and move on to the revolving door phenomenon. Okay, well the revolving door phenomenon is something that's very well known within the um, mental health care sector. So essentially what that is, is when um, you know, a mental health care user will come into the system, you know, let's say be in hospital, will um, recover there and so on, but, but then will be sent back out into the community, spat out, sent into the wild, you know, without any support, with the effect that they just relapse and become ill again and have to be readmitted to hospital. Now, hospitalization um, places a massive financial burden on the state, whereas community-based care or family care um, is a considerable, considerably smaller burden. Now, um, on that basis, you should the government should be doing everything they can to keep people in the community with their families instead of having them readmitted to hospital, which suggests that there needs to be all of this strengthening, you know, um, surrounding family and community-based care. But um, as was seen in life, Esidemeni, this clearly was not the case. So that takes me to the wonder question. What should an ideal system look like? Well, I think, um, as I was just saying, deinstitutionalization of people is of integral importance. Um, you know, it's long since been an imperative that you don't want people to be warehoused in hospitals. You want the people who can function and function well in communities living a little bit more independently to be, to be doing so. Um, and um, what's very important is you want a basket of services or a continuum to follow the uh, mental health care user from one point in the system to another point. So you want the so so you want the um, services, the facilities, the medication, the um, the support to be available at all levels of the system. But you don't want the person to be in an environment where they're overly restricted, like in a hospital. A hospital provides or um, imposes such limitations on things like freedom of movement that um, unless a person absolutely has to be in that restrictive environment, there's no reason why they should. The second thing that must be considered is what is known as the recovery model. So the recovery model focuses not again on warehousing people in hospitals, but on them becoming productive members mm, of the community, on building resilience. I like that, yeah. Um, on um, mm. them getting well and staying well. So what you've just described is that hospital is least empowering and most restrictive. And should the proper infrastructure be laid out in the community, it could become most empowering and least restrictive. And of course, enabling the person with a psychosocial disability to become a fulfilled and productive member of society despite whatever their challenges are in terms of mental health. Precisely. And in terms of the way forward, you know, for viewers out there, what would you advise them if they are faced with a situation where they have a member of their family sitting with a psychosocial disability and that person has not accessed or tapped into any resources out there? Um, what I would suggest is for that person to try and um, gain as much knowledge and information as possible. 
um, there is a lot of information on our website um, and um, you can call our help desk. Um, I, um, I do think that there is a dearth of information um, in our system about where to go and what to do. And I think this is a very notable challenge that um, cannot be um, overstated, you know. So Nicole, I want to just steer you in another direction quickly before we take an ad break. In terms of job opportunities, just going back to that caller, he spoke to being idle. And I think the concerns are that many people with uh, psychosocial disabilities are often finding themselves in a situation where they are left to their own devices and they sit there day in and day out doing absolutely nothing. So it just ignites or feeds into that illness or disability. Well, um, you, um, there are facilities called protective workshops. Okay, and maybe for... that's what we continue with. I like that the protective workshops so that viewers can actually uh, understand that there are other opportunities that persons with psychosocial disabilities can access. And we'll take an ad break and continue with that in the last segment. Sponsor an orphan and change a life today for only 1,500 rands per month or 18,000 rands per year. Contact the Al Iman Foundation on 011 Hello world, we are Lifestyle Ceramics. We offer a wide range of exclusive tiles and global bathroom brands under one roof. Roberto Cavalli, unique products, inspired by the Roberto Cavalli style. Select choices, inspired by color, realized and adapted according to the lifestyle of an individual, set off by an inspiration and turn them into exclusive pieces. The world moves fast. Shouldn't your money do the same? Have your funds cleared within 60 minutes with Al Baraka's real time clearance. Terms and conditions apply. Al Baraka, your partner bank. Discover dazzling diamond jewelry at Status Jewelers. Exquisite gold, diamond and silver jewelry to choose from. A stunning selection for any occasion. Custom made jewelry to suit your taste and budget. Style, charm, luxury. A symbol of elegance and an expression of your love. We want to help you find the most breathtaking jewelry for that special occasion. Come to Status Jewelers at the Oriental Plaza, Shop C99. Telephone 011-838-8473. Status Jewelers, where quality craftsmanship and integrity exceeds customer satisfaction. We are the Muslim Ummah, and each day that goes by, the harder we try, in gratitude we pray to Allah. Chosen as part of the best of mankind, we spread the word of Islam. Spread the word ah, Spread the word Ya Rabb Al-Alameen Ya Rahman Ya Rahim Ya Rabb Al-Alameen Ya Rahman Ya Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've come to the last segment of our discussion and our guest in studio, Nicole Breen, was talking about psychosocial disabilities and it being Psychosocial Disability Awareness Month. She's reflected on all the social stigma and the challenges experienced by persons with psychosocial disabilities. And before the ad break, we were speaking to protective workshops where persons with psychosocial disabilities could be empowered and able to become useful, contributing and productive members of society. 
Now, Nicole, I know we discussed this about the list of protective workshops. Perhaps if you could just um, explain to the viewers where they could access uh, such resources. Okay, um, well, again, I keep coming back to this. Um, you can contact um, ourselves um, or you can contact um, your local mental health society. Um, you will find that quite easily online. Um, and um, they should be able to direct you to the appropriate place. Okay, so the, obviously within the specific geographic location because the affiliates are uh, designated to specific geographic locations and they would have access to protective workshops so they could redirect, redirect the uh, callers or people requiring that kind of information to the relevant protective workshop. Yes. Okay. And I think with protective workshops, it's not just about enabling and empowering, uh, but people do receive stipends or some kind of remuneration benefits as, as contributing members towards the completion and execution of tasks on a daily basis. Yes. Okay, so we've come to the last segment. And just reflecting on the past three segments, and of course, psychosocial disability, what are the key messages that you would like to leave the viewers with? What are the take-home messages? I think um, first and foremost, we must look at the essence of our campaign. So we want to look at blockades in an era of continuum. So we want to consider the fact that there are bottlenecks in a system where um, it's meant to be, you know, law and policy says that it should be free flowing, you know. So um, it's actually the, the system, how it's functioning now is the opposite of how it should be functioning. Um, secondly, I think um, what I'd like to point out is that um, so um, life is at a many shone a spotlight on the mental health care system that had never been there before. Um, but it's been revealed since then that the system as a whole happens to be crumbling. And I think that that's important to bear in mind, you know, that there is no component of it that is functioning well at this point in time. And um, I think that, um, you know, mental health care users and their loved ones need to bear this in mind and need to prepare themselves for a difficult road ahead. Um, I think also um, that we need to take into account the fact that social stigma is rife and um, pervades into just about every aspect of the life of somebody with a psychosocial disability. And um, it's necessary to raise a considerable amount of awareness and to take considerable steps in um, ameliorating the situation to um, prevent um, this kind of discrimination from taking place. Um, I think that um, you know there needs to be a focus on um, um, the recovery model people. Um, you know, becoming independent, getting well and staying well, building resilience. And then there also needs to be a focus on deinstitutionalization. So, um, you know, people not living in this restrictive hospital environment when they don't have to. You know, when this is not, in fact, you know, an option, it's an international imperative, an internationally accepted approach. So those would be the points that I would like to raise. So you've also said that it's also the aftercare when they come out of that hospital setting where they have access to resources and that obviously if we're looking at reinforcing the infrastructure as we speak we know that the community-based care is not adequate and sufficient to meet and fulfill the needs of persons with psychosocial disabilities what you know what is your take to that um, I would say that, um, you know, it's been proven that deinstitutionalization can work and can work well. You know, in um, different jurisdictions around the world, this has been proven. Um, and um, I wouldn't say that life is a domani is a proper example of deinstitutionalization. You know, um, there um, are allegations that, you know, life is a domain. It was not a cost-cutting mechanism. It was not deinstitutionalization. Um, the rationale, of course, remains unclear. I'm just saying that, you know, there were these allegations. 
And, um, you know, um, that being said, um, you know, why ever the people were moved to those institutions was not tantamount to what um, deinstitutionalization is actually supposed to resemble. Okay, and I mean, that has been a huge learning curve for us, life is a domini, and obviously lots of measures have been put into place, lots of action has been taken, but lots of lives have been lost and lots of people have suffered multiple losses. Um, and on that note, I know we've come to the end of the show. We would certainly like to thank you for your valuable input. I'm sure viewers will agree that it was enlightening the information you provided and that people have an idea of where to access support, intervention and assistance when needed. And on that note, we would, I would like to end with a verse from the Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asri innal insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bis sabr. Sadaqallahu al-azim. Until health matters next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Me.